This call is being recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect at this time. I will now turn the call over to Arlene Dowell. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you to Gina Bunn Hector from the Census Bureau for hosting our webinar. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy St. Patrick's Day. And thank you for joining us for our March LED webinar. Before I introduce our presenters, I am thrilled to invite all of you to the 2021 Local Employment Dynamics Partnership Virtual Workshop on Friday, April 30th. This year's theme is New Horizons Charting the Course with Data. We will be highlighting the work of our state labor market information partners and other data users through plenary sessions. Please visit our website at lehd.ces. Dot census dot gov for more information. On behalf of the U.S. Census Bureau and the Local Employment Dynamics Partnership, in collaboration with the Council for Community and Economic Research and the Labor Market Information Institute, it is my pleasure to welcome Alexandra Lee, Nicole Bouchot, and Trey Manharts from Zillow as they present Using Census and Zillow data to understand COVID-19's impact on the housing market. This presentation will demonstrate how the Zillow's economic research team regularly pairs census data with Zillow's local housing market data in their research. 2020 presented a unique challenge in trying to understand quickly developing and unprecedented business market trends. This webinar will focus on Zillow's use of census data in their research surrounding COVID-19's effects on local housing markets, particularly on how remote work might help have shifted housing preferences. Alexandra Lee is an ec economist on Zillow's economic research team. She uses data and economic analyses to understand and answer questions about the housing market with a particular focus on how policy affects local markets. Prior to joining Zillow, she, was, she worked as an economic consultant in antitrust and financial litigations in industries ranging from healthcare to transportation. Alexandra holds bachelor's degrees in economics and political science from the University of Chicago. Nicole Bichot joined Zillow as a market analyst in February 2018. She currently works as an economic data analyst on the economics research team using data to develop and validate research content. Prior to working at Zillow, Nicole was a consultant for Landessa, working in the Center for Women's Land Rights. Nicole holds two bachelor's degrees in development economics and global development from Seattle Pacific University. Trey Manhurts joined Zillow in November 2018 as a 20 as a data analyst on the economic research team to develop and validate research content. He previously managed data pipelines and disability estimations for chronic health disorders at the University of Washington's Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. Trey received his Bachelor's of Arts in Economics with a correlate in Computer Science at Vassar College. With that, I will hand it over to Alexandra Lee. Thank you, Erlene, and thanks for that introduction. Um, so again, I'm here today uh, with my colleagues, Nicole and Trey, and we're just going to talk through um, some of our research that uses census and Zillow data to understand COVID-19's impact on the housing market. Um, and just to note that um, the other team members have spoken in the series before, and it's just always a treat to be invited because we use so much census data in our research. So, you know, internally at Zillow, we have data on every listing that makes it on our site, but to tell nuanced stories, we need data on things like demographics, income, occupation, and for that, we heavily rely on census. So, in the past year, when housing has reacted so surprisingly to the pandemic and its economic fallout, we really wanted to drill down on what types of places saw different market trends, who the market was affecting, both negatively and positively. So for this presentation, we've rounded up some of our research over 2020 that really digs into this question. But before I dive into the research, I just want to take um, a minute to talk about our team. And 
Our team's mission is to be the most open, authoritative source for timely and accurate housing data and unbiased insight. Our goal is to empower consumers, industry professionals, policymakers, and researchers to better understand the housing market. So in practice, this means getting our data and research in front of audiences like this, as well as working with local and national housing reporters to help them understand their beats, uh, creating relevant research on various housing-related policy, um, things like that. So if any of that sounds interesting at all, I'd encourage you to check out our research site, zillow.com slash research. Uh, and this is just a recent screenshot of it. You'll see, you know, plugging my own name a little here, uh, my recent research piece on uh, how a $15,000 tax credit could um, help really bolster first-time homeownership. Um, and you'll see, you know, our full body of research on that site. And I also keep talking about our data. And the good news is that a lot of it is publicly available for download on our data site. So these are aggregated metrics that we create, um, aggregated in that uh, we, we create metrics at various geography levels, so national, metro, down to the zip code. Uh, we have data on things like home values, our VHVI, Zillow Home Value Index. Um, we also have rentals, inventory and sales, um, and these are created on a periodic basis, uh, weekly and monthly views, and these are really the data that we turn to um, to keep our finger on the pulse of the housing market to really understand where the trends are going. And as you can imagine, this very data uh, really allowed us a real-time view uh, on what was happening um, during the pandemic, especially, you know, during the lockdowns. And uh, during the lockdowns, right, starting in March, um, going through early spring, summer, um, the housing market really came to a screeching halt. So here we have new for sale inventory and sales year over year. And you'll see that, you know, deep drop um, in the spring. But, you know, what really shocked us was the speed and size of the rebound, um, especially in sales uh, after the lockdown started being list lifted. Uh, you'll see that new for sale inventory also improved from that low in the summer, but it never really took off the way that sales did. And it even ended 2020 at lower levels than the year before. And that just really shows how buyers have really hit the market in a big way throughout 2020, or at least since the lockdowns, but sellers just haven't. Um, and that's created a very competitive home buying market, really competitive conditions. And just to backtrack a little bit and say that even before the pandemic, um, going into 2020, we did expect this to be a strong home buying season. Um, just looking at the demographics of potential buyers out there. So um, there's this huge uh, wave of millennials, uh, this huge generation that's aging into their home buying years, and we're pretty much just at the start of that crest. So we expected this home buying season to be strong, but I think this past year really surprised all of us uh, in terms of just how strong it was. And then as the year wore on, um, another surprising trend that came to light was that home values and rents were actually diverging. Um, and here you'll see year-over-year -year trends for, for both of these series, and you'll see that sharp divergence happened just as the pandemic hit. And the economic recovery of the, from the pandemic has been described as K-shaped. And um, I think we can apply that here as well, um, you know, beyond the obvious K-shape, but uh, it's the, the higher income households that have been largely insulated from the economic impacts of the pandemic, right? And it's these higher income households that are more likely to be buyers, to be potential home buyers and sellers. Um, and they've really been able to participate in the for sale housing market. And then on the other hand, we have lower income households, more likely to be renters that have been really negatively impacted by the pandemic, you know, job loss, wage loss. And that's forced a lot of them to pursue affordability maneuvers, you know, like doubling up, um, 
from CPS, we know that a lot of young adults move back in uh, with their families during this time. So that really created a waning in rental demand, um, which really caused rents to, to really slow down. But I think among the biggest media stories in the last year, um, starting, you know, sometime in the summer, was this narrative that started building steam um, that we were seeing a mass exodus in our cities. You know, we started fielding all these questions about whether COVID has killed our cities. And um, obviously that's not a yes or no question, um, or at least it shouldn't be. Um, so over the last year, we really tried to answer this question in a few different ways. Um, but what quickly became clear was that there were very different regional responses. So we really dug into this question um, over this last year, and we wanted to look at how some of the key indicators behaved in urban versus suburban areas across the country, you know, things like inventory, sales, and prices, as well as rents. And to tackle this question, we needed some way to define urban and suburban areas, which there is surprisingly little consensus on. So obviously, census defines metro areas, but that's not too helpful when we're trying to break out areas within metros. So luckily, we could use some of the work of a former truly a chief economist, which classifies zip codes into urban, suburban, and rural. And I link that methodology here, but basically it takes Zillow Group survey data where respondents classify their own zip codes into urban, suburban, rural. And then it takes that survey data and includes census variables on things like population density, age of the housing stock, um, other housing related variables to create this classification. So here we just see uh, the DC area and beyond. Um, you'll see that the urban zip codes of D.C. and Baltimore more further afield are in orange, and suburban zip codes are in blue. And what we were able to tell, even at a regional level, was that the northeast and west were showing a very clear divergence compared to the Midwest and south. So in all these regions, you'll see that inventory, which is on this bottom series, inventory in urban areas consistently trended higher than suburban. But there was only this consistent upward trend in urban inventory in the west and northeast. And it's clear that this is because new inventory, so the series on the top, new inventory in urban areas consistently outpaced suburban areas. So it's not just that there aren't as many urban buyers in the West and Northeast, but there's also this glut of urban sellers. But within the Northeast and West regions, New York and San Francisco are particular standouts. So inventory in both areas surged in the city proper compared to the metro during the summer. And at the same time, sales in the city proper lagged behind the metro overall. So we're seeing evidence that demand really is waning in the urban cores of these metros um, and in the west and northeast generally. You know, sellers are flocking to the market, but buyers aren't really coming close to meeting that supply. Um, so in both these areas, we're seeing that inventory is actually accumulating in the urban areas. So the New York, New York and San Francisco being big media markets, you know, that grain of truth of waning urban demand might have really propelled all these urban exodus news pieces last year. But what was also happening at the same time was the opposite trend in a lot of more affordable markets, especially in the Midwest. So throughout last year, we started seeing that urban home values in a number of Midwest markets were outpacing suburban homes. And that gap only grew throughout the year in many areas. So you'll see here that Kansas City is leading the pack, but Cleveland, Indianapolis, and more are also seeing this similar trend. So to recap, we have this divergence where urban areas lagged in expensive markets like New York and San Francisco, but the opposite divergence was happening in cheaper markets like Kansas City, 
in Cleveland where urban areas are booming. And this boils down to the relative affordability of urban versus suburban areas. So in metros where urban home values were cheaper than suburban homes before the pandemic, urban home value growth was higher throughout the pandemic. But on the flip side, most larger expensive metros have cheaper suburban homes, and that's where the demand went in those areas. So suburban price growth was higher in expensive metros. So the takeaway here is that cities as a whole aren't dying. You know, there's not a mass exodus. But in these larger and more expensive metros, it appears that people perhaps just aren't willing to pay those premiums anymore to live near amenities that they can't enjoy during a pandemic, right? Restaurants, museums, theaters. But where urban areas are more affordable, we're actually seeing a boom in demand. And this relationship is reflected in rents as well. So earlier we mentioned how home values and rents diverged. And that divergence is happening in most metros, but in larger expensive metros in particular, uh, that divergence is particularly wide and urban rents have fallen considerably. So again, New York and San Francisco uh, is at the top of the list here, but also Seattle, DC and Austin are among metros where not only is the gap in urban and suburban rent trends wide, uh, but urban rents have even fallen. And in these expensive markets, it's even the most expensive zip codes that have seen rents fall in the most. So while we can attribute some rental softening in most markets to job loss and wage loss, in these expensive markets, it looks like it's the most affluent renters that are leaving or not moving in. So renters that probably work in jobs that are more likely to be remotable and who have the flexibility and savings to move somewhere else. So with that, I'll hand it over to Nicole to switch gears a little bit and talk about what we know about the pandemic. Thanks, Alexandra. So as she mentioned, we're going to start talking now about some pre-pandemic trends looking at the connection between housing and jobs. Um, so we can go ahead and move to the next slide. It's important to call out the relationship between housing and jobs and how intertwined these things are. At the macro level, job gains influence housing. When an area gets an increase in jobs, people will move there to work, putting pressure on the housing market, which will often result in an increase in prices. We see in these graphs here the differences in how metros are able to match housing growth to job gains. For larger, typically more expensive metros on the left, even a small increase in jobs has driven up home values. Smaller metros on the right, often more sprawling and less expensive, are better able to match housing to job gains, something that has positioned them well for what we are about to talk about. Next slide. At the micro level, the connection between housing and jobs is seen through the importance we place on the proximity between where we live and where we work. In 2019, Zillow surveyed renters, buyers, and sellers to gauge how far they were willing to commute between home and work. Most landed on 30 minutes one way, stressing how important being close to the workplace is for many. Almost two-thirds of buyers surveyed said their commute was very or extremely important when deciding on where to live, and over half of renters cited the same. There is no doubt that this proximity is important. But to better understand the relationship between the home and the workplace, we analyzed 2017 modes data to get a better sense of what this actually looks like in action. Next slide. One surprising finding when looking at the classifications of where people live and where they work is there's a pretty high share of what we are calling reverse commuters across the country. These are workers who live in urban zip codes but commute to work in suburban and rural zip codes. We already mentioned the short commute times were a significant driver for where people live. So the fact that some were choosing to live urban and work suburban is interesting. We combined this with Zillow's data on home values and found, and found that these reverse commuters were more likely to be concentrated in less expensive markets. In 20 of the top 35 largest markets, over half of urban workers were reverse commuters. In markets like Orlando, Tampa, and Riverside, over 70% of urban residents work outside of urban areas. 
But then on the other side of the graph, we see places like San Francisco, New York, and Los Angeles, denser and more expensive coastal markets, where the share of reverse commuters is considerably lower. And there is a fundamental distinction between the places where reverse commuters thrive and where they don't. Next slide. Here, we see the relationship between reverse commuters and the difference in urban versus suburban home value growth during the pandemic. Metros where urban areas currently, right now, have higher growth had higher shares of reverse commuters in 2017. So having the highest share of reverse commuters is actually an indicator for how a metro would fare during the pandemic. What's important about this is that these metros are the same ones we looked at earlier that are more sprawling, often less expensive, and those factors have allowed them to keep housing in pace with job gain, and those factors create environments for reverse, for reverse commuters to thrive. People will live where it is affordable for them to do so, especially if that happens to be in a place like an urban core where they have access to more amenities and services than they would in suburban areas, even if that means that they have a longer commute to work. This is why we don't see a huge share of reverse commuters in places like San Francisco and New York. It's more affordable in those metros to live in the suburbs. And that's something that's really key in this whole conversation around the great reshuffling and where people will move as a result. And this is especially important to call out when we go back to the media conversations Alexandra mentioned earlier about the death of cities and how the pandemic will, one way or another, change the identity of urban America and push everybody to the suburbs. This is not what we're seeing in the current data, and this is not what these reverse commuting trends are pointing to. Next slide. Something worthwhile to call out here is that reverse commuting trends aren't specific to any one generation. This isn't a millennial fad that will fade as younger generations start having families and moving from city life to the suburbs. Older urban residents are as likely, and even more likely in some markets, like Charlotte, San Jose, and Washington, D.C., to be reverse commuters. This is another signal that urban centers aren't going to die. People will continue to live where it makes sense for them to do so. Next slide. And that's true even with the rise of remote working. Long before the pandemic in 2019, Zillow surveyed recent home buyers who work remotely at least one day a week to get a sense of how remote work influences housing decisions. Of those who made a major, major housing change, over half cited remote work as a driver for their housing decisions. So remote work might change how people choose to live after all. So is the media right? Well, not entirely, because at the least same remote workers were more likely to buy in urban areas than non-remote workers. And this is found for both the population of buyers who worked remote at least one day a week and those who were fully remote. Even without physical ties to the workplace, people still choose to live in urban areas, a trend we anticipate will stick around as vaccines become more widely distributed, the world settles into a new normal, and the great reshuffling continues. Now I'm going to pass it off to Trey to talk about how the role of telecommuting plays in the current picture. Thanks, Nicole. So the pandemic was a shock to the housing market in several ways, and Alexandra talked about how the media narratives of it being the death of cities were largely overblown, uh, and many of those stories were anchored on disease risk and social distancing as the reason for urban dissolution. But that doesn't make a lot of sense given what we know about how people make housing decisions in general, uh, particularly the choice to buy with the upfront cost and the longer time horizon that that entails. The great majority of home buyers will stay in that home for more than four years, and most make the choice of where to buy based on affordability, amenities, and major life events, like a new job, a growing family, or kids moving out, things with lifestyle implications on the scale of several years. So this is where we should look for potential long-term changes in housing. And Nicole set the stage here. Housing has been closely tied to work, not just in affordability, uh, with incomes determining price points, but in terms of location, with, uh, with job concentration accelerating price growth as people look to find homes within half an hour of their workplace uh, and with all the amenities that they and their families need. So a shift to uh, telework for those that feasibly could, at least part-time, would relieve some of that centralized pressure on the housing market in job centers. Uh, Nicole showed a survey from Zillow in the pre-pandemic days of 2019 where about half of remote working buyers uh, said that remote work led to a major housing change, including 40% or so who actually moved. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we conducted another survey in May of 2020, almost two months into shutdowns, to check our expectations on this. And of Americans working from home, 
75% said that they would prefer to continue working uh, at least half time remotely after their workplace reopens. And for us, us that confirms that this trend has the potential to endure post pandemic. Of these possible long term remote workers, 66% said that they would consider moving if they could work from home uh, or remotely uh, as often as they want. Compare that to relatively few who ascribe their desire to move to social distancing. So there's a changing intersection of work, home, uh, and affordability, and Zillo Research looked at one facet of this to see where people's housing options would be most affected by a switch to remote work. We looked at the share of renters in major U.S. metro areas that could feasibly buy a home in the broader U.S. market uh, outside of their metro if allowed to telework in their current job. And so here's the headline. Uh, next slide. 4.5% of renters are on the telework tipping point for home ownership. Uh, that's almost 2 million households in all. And so this tipping point is where a renter household earns enough to buy the typical U.S. starter home, but not a starter home in their current metro area, and that they're in a remote job. And when I refer to starter home, I'm referring to uh, the middle uh, of the lower third of the price distribution, so about the 17th percentile uh, home by price. So to get a count of who is in a remotable job, we used estimates of who could work remotely uh, by industry and occupation. In a BLS report using the uh, American Time Use Survey, uh, we then mapped this to industries and occupations in the American Community Survey to get really granular with it. And this let us get these metro level estimates and go even deeper on uh, race. So as you might expect here, uh, markets where renters are on this tipping point are the more expensive markets where renters earn a lot relative to nationally and are more likely to be in remotable occupations, for example, in uh, tech or financial services. Uh, California metros are predictably high on the list uh, with San Jose at the top with 25% of renters who can maintain their current job uh, and buy a home somewhere more, afford more affordable. Uh, now, clearly there are a lot of reasons why someone might not want to leave their metro area and not all jobs uh, that are remotable can be completely remote, but you can imagine that many folks needing to go into work only a couple days a week might be okay with a longer commute and so might take the opportunity then to buy a home even uh, just a little further out from the urban core in metros where that makes sense. Uh, so let's now look at the city level. Pictured here are metros among the largest 50 uh, in which starter homes in the metro area are more expensive than nationally or starter homes in the city are more expensive than in the metro at large. In other words, where there is a price incentive to move outward. Uh, so looking over here at the, the graph on the left, um, on the x-axis, we saw uh, what we saw on the last slide, uh, the share of renters that could leave the metro to buy a home. Uh, on the y-axis is uh, the share of renters living in the named city that could afford to buy a home elsewhere in the metro at large. Um, so same thing, but on a smaller scale. We see that there's a split among the expensive metros where some have extra expensive cities. So in addition to those who could benefit by leaving the metro, there are more uh, renters with slightly higher income who could buy a home just by moving out of the urban core into the suburbs. Uh, calling back to uh, the stats from the urban suburban report, we see how uh, these groupings compared in home value growth during the pandemic. Uh, the graph over on the right shows that in metros that are generally lower cost, the cities were actually hotter. Uh, home values in the city center uh, in these areas grew over a percentage point faster on average than the metro at large, uh, referring to just the metros pictured here. The uh, expensive metros generally were uh, a bit of a mixed bag. Um, 
But the areas with extra expensive cities saw uh, those cities underperform their metros by about two percentage points. Uh, perhaps not surprising, but where people had the most reason to leave based on affordability and the most flexibility to leave from telework, uh, there was the most softening in the market. And this is what combining uh, these rich data sets has let us study. Again, this is census data, uh, BLS data, and Zillow data combined to paint a complex and localizable picture. Uh, and I'll dig a little deeper here to show uh, quickly just uh, one more layer of how powerful this can be. When talking about access to housing, it's always important to understand who has access and why. And you might guess that since uh, black households have the lowest median incomes uh, and low incomes correlate with less remotable work, that black renters would have the least access to opportunities presented by a broad shift to remote work. And uh, that could be true, but not at this homeownership tipping point that we're looking at here. Let's take a look at how that works. Uh, first, without income or home values, uh, here we have a breakdown of what share of renters by race uh, work in each industry. The leftmost column has the most remotable industries. The rightmost column has the least remotable industries. We see that uh, white and Asian renters, the gray and navy blue bars here, have jobs skewed toward the left, more remotable. Black renters, the gold bar, have jobs that tend more toward the middle. And Latin renters, the bright blue bar, have jobs skewing toward the right, less remotable. So all else equal, we'd expect uh, white and Asian renters to have the greatest boost from remote work. Uh, but all else isn't equal. Uh, white and Asian renters in those more remotable industries are also more likely to have incomes that put them over the threshold to buy a home in their current uh, home metro area. So location isn't likely to be the primary reason not to buy. Uh, going remote isn't as likely to convert to homeownership. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, here's how those conditional likelihoods look by metro area. Uh, for white and Asian renters um, on the outer graphs here, um, most metros fall below the x-axis, uh, meaning for remotable occupations, incomes are not as likely to be in the right range, the relevant range for what we're studying here. Uh, now, comparing the inner charts for black and Latin renters, we see that despite comparable income levels overall, Latin renters with qualifying incomes are less likely to be in remotable jobs the points far, uh, far to the left. Only black renters are consistently more likely across metros to be earning qualifying income, incomes in remotable jobs. And this uh, makes them 29% more likely overall across US metros to be at that telework tipping point for homeownership. Now, I've, I've talked a lot about uh, achieving homeownership and affordability constraints at one end of the uh, spectrum here, but there's another side of the remote work equation that hints at coming changes in some markets. And for that, I'll pass it back to Nicole. Thanks, Trey. Um, yeah, so now we're going to talk a little bit about where we're going in the future. Um, this will end this on a little bit of a liner note. Um, we can go to the next slide. Remote work has opened doors for many to reconsider their housing options, as Trey has talked about. But even for those for whom remote work isn't an option, the last year has inspired people to dream a little broader about where they can see themselves in the future. For many, that might have meant hours of Zillow surfing and luxurious markets to imagine life would be like in a beach town or a ski town. We used ACS data to identify vacation towns, places with high shares of second and vacation homes, and analyze how different Zillow metrics are performing in these areas. We consider things like page views, the number of times someone clicks on a house page on Zillow, favorites, the number of times people save those pages, and pending sales data, the year-over-year -year increase in the number of listings that went pending in any given week, to see how these places, these vacation towns, stacked up against the rest of the country. Combined, page views for for sale listings in these vacation towns were up almost 50% in August 2020 when we ran this report from the year prior. 
compared to 37% increase in page views nationally over the same period. So people were definitely more interested in these areas. And favorites were higher as well, indicating um, that people were, again, saving these homes and coming back to look at them in the future. These metrics are signals that people might be shifting their preferences and dreaming a little broader, but they don't necessarily indicate any of these looky loos are hard set on actually moving to these vacation towns. However, when we looked at growth and pending sales, we saw that two-thirds of the vacation towns that we analyzed had higher year-over-year -year growth rates and pending sales the week that we ran this report, showing that some buyers were already making the move to make their dreams a reality. Um, so this is just a glimpse of where we're going in the future. Um, and that brings us to the end of our presentation. Um, so we thank you for having us here today. It's such an honor to be able to share our research, especially our research that has been so heavily influenced by all of these amazing census data products. Um, I'll pass it off now to the operator for Q&A. Thank you. If you have a question from the phone, please press star followed by the number one. Please make sure to unmute your phone to record your name at the prompt. Again, that is star one for any questions. One moment, please, while questions come through. And while we wait for the questions to queue up on the phone, I'd like to remind everyone to please be courteous and keep your questions pertaining to the presentation with one follow-up question. We received a few questions regarding the presentation, which will be accessible on the Census Academy website in a week or two at census.gov academy under the webinar tab. Also, an evaluation will be mailed to you following this webinar. We would appreciate if you could take the time to fill this short survey out so that we can better serve you. With that, operator, are there any calls at this time? I am showing no questions at this time. It is star one if you have a question. So some questions did come out on the chat. Um, one of the questions was, uh, what, what does the observed rent metric count? Is it percent change in renters or rents? So I'll take this one. It is rent, listed rent, um, and it's a repeat rent index, which means that we look at um, what the same unit is listed at um, one time and then the next time. So we capture the change in comparable units. So it controls for things like housing quality. Um, but yeah, it is listed rent. Thank you, Alexandra. Here's another question. Does Zillow expect to have change does Zillow expect to have to change their presences to deal with application of differential privacy that will introduce noise in, into the census products at the local and lower geographic levels? What methods are they looking to use, not particularly focused on COVID, but in your overall usage of census data? I can take this one. Um, that's a great question. We uh, we don't have any methods around that right now, but it's a it's a great point, and there are areas where that will uh, potentially affect our estimates. For example, uh, we estimate the HVI by race, uh, and it uses small level uh, racial distributions in uh, housing to make those uh, calculations, and so that'll be something that we need to be uh, fairly considerate of. That said, most of our estimations are at a larger uh, geographical level, um, and so likely won't be affected. Um, that's a great question. Operator, are there any questions on the phone? We do have questions from the phone. The first one comes from David. Your line is open. Thank you. Fascinating work. And I was wondering if you could compare the trend before the COVID pandemic uh, from urban to suburban or more rural areas uh, over a longer historical period. Was, is there a, a trend like 1% to 2% or 5% a year one way or another? And how much did that change? And I'll ask it kind of a quasi follow-up, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so, and, you know, Nicole, I'm sure you jump in if, if you know more than I do. But um, short answer is I don't have those numbers, um, you know, at, at, ready, at the ready. Um, that's certainly something we can do. Uh, we have these data 
carries over a longer period than just, you know, the last two years. Um, yeah. Sorry, I don't have a, a more complete okay. um, answer for perfect. you, but, yeah, that's a great point. I don't either, but uh, the, the other part is, do you have any information on trends moving to the U.S. Virgin Islands? Um, for that in particular, we do not. <laughs> we look at, um, you know, the, the 50 states. Very good. Thank you all very much. It's very enjoyable. Oh, thank you. The next question comes from Liz Annette. Your line is open. Hi, everybody. Excellent presentation. I'm looking forward to downloading it so I can consume all the actual data that's in it. It, it was exquisite. Um, so my question is, um, about the trends that were projected for people moving out of the more expensive areas into the more suburban areas. Um, is it expected that the pricing or the affordability of housing in the more expensive areas will start to decrease? Or, I mean, the pricing decrease and the affordability go up? Or would it be expected, or can you see a trend, in the suburban pricing continue to rise? as well as the extra expensive areas keeping high so that affordability overall will become more difficult and impacting migration, of course. Mm -hmm. um, again, Nicole and Trey jumped in if you have more to add, but um, I think the short story is that we are, you know, the way that we are um, sort of understanding that the demand is shifting is in pricing, right? So. Um, areas where, um, you know, there's these extra expensive cities. Um, we have seen the HVI or Zillow Home Value Index um, really, you know, moderate or even decrease in those areas, whereas suburban home value growth, um, you know, might still show pretty strong growth. Um, the reverse is true in areas where um, urban home values or urban homes are, are still quite in strong demand. We have seen urban home value growth increase over suburban. Um, you know, that said, you know, prices are somewhat cyclical. You know, they, they moderate if they come to a point with that, um, you know, affordability is just too, too skewed, right? We saw in 2019 a lot of very expensive metros saw a decrease in, in home values. Um, so, I, again, I don't, I don't think we have firm, you know, long-term estimates um, in terms of urban versus suburban. Um, home value trends, but we are seeing some of these effects already. Thank you. Um, and definitely it's something to look, and as well if you match that with uh, race, as you had presented here, that would be very interesting to see if there are any chips among the races and the uh, affordability of the house or the places, how to become more affordable for those. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. The next question comes from Lori. Your line is open. Hi, I'm in Maine, and we've seen two trends here. One is teleworkers coming into the state, which has helped with um, – we've had a workforce depletion over quite a long time. But the, the bigger trend has been people moving in because the state is safe, but moving to very rural areas. And we're wondering how long they're going to stay here if, you know, if the vaccine takes hold and we get – herd immunity, will they suddenly flock out of the state, or what kind of trends are you seeing elsewhere that might reflect what might happen in rural Maine? Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And again, I think, you know, we just we just don't have a crystal ball that can help you there, and that's definitely something that we're, we're trying to um, track as well, just what will happen with more vaccine rollout. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think generally our data doesn't cover rural areas very well. Um, but to the extent that, you know, tele teleworking um, to suburban areas and broader are uh, topics that we're looking into, um, you know, that's just something we'll have to, to keep in mind. Yeah, and I'd just like to point out that, yeah, this is one of the reasons that we're looking at this remote work trend in particular because uh, we think that it won't be a sort of transient um, phenomenon that would lead someone to buy a home somewhere and necessarily leave uh, a year or two later. Uh, it's more likely to be 
long term. So if their long term preferences uh, are stable, uh, you might expect that to be a longer uh, longer term residency. Um, okay. Is the reason we're focusing on work. Okay, thank you. The next question comes from Guadalupe. Your line is open. Thank you very much. Um, first, let me say, gosh, this is some great work here. I, I got to commend you on that. Um, and my question, um, I've got two questions. One is very simple. The other one is a little bit more complex. I was just wondering if on your site uh, you have uh, this information as it is affected by the availability of homes in certain, um, you know, metro areas, uh, the, the urban areas and the, and the suburban areas. And then my second question is regarding the actual presentation, the slides, if those would be, will be made uh, available or could be made available to us. Um, for the second, yes, definitely these will be available. Um, I think early in or, or the host might have more information on just exactly how to access. I think I missed your first question though. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Um, first question, is, is your information on your website, does it include um, the effect of house, housing, you know, um, uh, homes that are actually for sale, uh, availability in the regions? Um, because I know that in some regions we have seen a, a huge increase in, um, in my area in particular, in the San Bernardino County, um, in California, a huge increase in, in cost for homes because the availability is not there. Um, yeah. So I was wondering yeah. how that, you know, if that was part of your factors in there. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that's just data that we have, right? Inventory, um, total inventory as well as um, new inventory are, are both data that we that we look at. Um, and in terms of research, yeah, that's definitely a big factor that we see in what's making um, competition so, so fierce, right? So it's driving up prices. Um, it's also shortening the days of pending, right, the number of days it takes a listing to, to from hitting our site to going into pending. Um, so, so yeah, you'll definitely find some research on our site, and if there's, like, particular geographies that you're interested in, um, you, could, you could probably find data on our data site as well. Wonderful. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Donna. Your line is open. Thank you. So I enjoyed your presentation. Um, just anecdotally, I'm in the Kansas City metro market where it is affordable in the city, but the, the downside is the school districts and the crime. So, for instance, our son and, and his wife are looking in the suburban areas, don't have the option for remote work in their jobs, um, 25 to 30 bids, you know, competing. And so the availability in the kind of beginner price range is exceedingly low, whereas on the, the lower price range in the in the urban areas and then the um, kind of the trade up kind of pricing, there's plenty of inventory. So the, the total inventory picture doesn't really tell the picture because all the competition is in a in a particular segment and then in particular areas where the school districts are better. So it's, okay. it's, you know, it's hard to get a, a full picture. I understand Zillow BLS and, and census doesn't include yeah. school district data. Um, but just curious as to if there's a way of tracking like who the buyers are, because in many cases they're competing against cash buyers, which implies these are investors. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, we don't have that data, just, you know, the source. Of, um, right. I didn't think so. But it's yeah, just another um, aspect, I guess, to the data that's... Yeah. No, that's a great point. Um, and like like I was saying just for the last question, you know, we do look at other sorts of metrics to try to understand market competition and hotness. So, you know, it might look like there is very low inventory, but is it because there's not many sellers putting their homes on the market, or is it just a lot of buyers that are taking up the inventory very quickly? Um, so, yeah, definitely, you know, just looking at inventory itself doesn't tell the full picture. I think it's um, important to look at, too, Zillow recently released um, some research around a survey we did where sellers 
potential home sellers said they would be more likely to sell once the vaccine is more widely distributed. So, you know, over the past year, we've seen really depressed supply and an increase in demand. That might be shifting slightly in the future um, as more people feel comfortable putting their homes in the market. Um, so it's definitely something to consider for the future. And I, I don't think you can completely rule out the psychological factor because their friends are all buying houses, so they want to buy a house too. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't don't want FOMO. <laughs> right, right. I mean, it, it's the, the the demographics of the millennial generation is just kind of late to the party, and they're all joining it. Once, <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you. The next question comes from Ruth. Your line is open. Yes, thank you. Uh, Excellent presentation, Alexandria, Nicole, and Trey. I am in the rural area, and like you're saying, there's very little data. And I'm not blaming the census, but when they were supposed to have the enumerators come out, at that time the data uh, wasn't collected. So my question is about the rentals. Uh, The first one is about rentals by venue. So I'm part of agritourism in South Carolina, and our members have a brochure out. So the rental situation, whether it's by venue or by um, zip code, there's some interest in visiting farms, visiting uh, farms with animals, crop, or trees, and finding out more about it as people pass our area to go to the beach. So rentals is not being included or venues by the census data in the rural areas. And and that's a problem because it helps Mm -hmm. us market what we're offering besides raising crop uh, animals and trees. And then the other uh, interest is about um, the um, foreclosure listings or sheriff sales, um, in particular zip codes. Uh, I know that's not an answer in the census either, but if that's tracked in a sense, then it would feed into the house sales (laughs) uh, indirectly. But even uh, so, what we find too in the southern states is that the climate change now, more hurricanes and other stuff that haven't been happening, um, the wanting to buy in the warmer climates is interesting, but then the opposite of the insurance factor, because that's another thing to track, um, you know, uh, climate change, weather incidents is going to be a factor as far as the future of buying in warmer climates with the climate change. So um, I'm just saying we need more data, and uh, Zillow can trace it and track it more than um, the census, which kind of ended 2020, but I know there's, you know, the American APS in between, but we really, uh, rural areas need more focus, and um, climate change needs to be considered, and foreclosures and sheriff sales that could lead to a, a better purchase or whatever. Okay, thank you. Yeah. No, that's a great point. Um, you know, even at Zillow, I imagine rural data is just sparser just because there's less homes. Um, so it's, it's harder to sort of guarantee and validate data quality. Um, that said, you know, rural well, housing is, is a topic that we, we definitely try to think about um, and try to be creative um, in, in, in learning more about it uh, despite data challenges. Um, and in terms of climate change, definitely, you know, important topic. Um, we have some research on our research site about, you know, homes in, in high-risk areas. Um, I'd encourage you to check it out if, if that sounds interesting. Thank you. The next question comes from Melanie. Your line is open. Hi. Thanks for the presentation. Um, early on, uh, you all talked about um, lower income households being um, more impacted by COVID negatively than um, higher uh, income households. Can you talk a little bit about what uh, metrics were used to to measure that? Yeah, so I think um, just on that slide, you know, looking at home values for for versus rents, that was just based on um, you know. It, we didn't pull from that data directly, but um, for other research, we've looked at you know unemployment and the types of industries that are that were more um, likely or more more strongly affected um, by the loss during the pandemic. And you know, as you can imagine, they were largely service industry jobs 
um, jobs that generally just have um, uh, lower incomes. Um, yeah, Nicole, am I missing anything? I know you've listened to that data. Uh, could you repeat the question really quick just so I can make sure I'm understanding it? So just what metrics were used to uh, measure the um, relative impact of COVID on um, households by income in regards to housing? Yeah. Yeah, so I think Alexandra got most of it. You know, we also looked at how unemployment across different job sectors um, impacted different households, um, and that definitely plays into the, the income levels as well. Okay, great. Thank you both. Just a reminder, if you have a question for the phone, is a star one, and the next question comes from Daniel. Your line is open. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you for that great work. Um, that's just uh, really, really clear uh, results. Um, so I'd just like to ask a little bit more along uh, a broader picture of the economy. H have you looked at or observed or studied the uh, impact of uh, housing, new housing permits? And have you also looked at the uh, composition of buyers and sellers in terms of household size? Because I would say a household with children is going to have a slightly different dynamic than like a, a two a married people with no children, um, as well as by age, you know, elderly, more elderly buyers and sellers versus uh, younger buyers and sellers and millennials. That's all I have. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so for the second question, we don't um, we don't have data through Zillow on, you know, buyer and seller characteristics. Um, any research around that, I think we would actually turn to, like a census data source. Um, you know, our recent research about um, the potential effects of a $15,000 first-time home buyer tax credit, for example, we look at renter households and, um, like, who are the households that are most likely to have incomes that can afford the monthly payment on a home. Um, so sort of the implication being that the only hurdle for them is a down payment. And um, you'll see we, we look at that breakout by, by race, and we might guess that, you know, white households, also Asian households, are much better positioned than black and Hispanic households um, to buy. So, so stuff like that, you know, we would, we would look at census. Um, and I'm sorry, I think I, I think I forgot your first question. <laughs> oh, uh, I was uh, referring to... Uh, have you looked at housing starts, how, how it correlates or oh. not correlates? Uh, and I would add um, also interest rates are, uh, affecting uh, mortgages. So, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't know that we've had um, research just like tightly correlating housing starts to whatever else is happening to the market. Um, we understand that, um, that, you know, builders are noticing this influx in demand and, um, so, so we expect that housing starts would improve. Um, obviously, interest rates have been at sort of record lows throughout last year, and that's definitely um, what we see as a, a very big driver uh, for demand over this last year. Thank you. The next question comes from Samantha. Your line is open. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, this is a very good presentation. I apologize, I missed probably the first uh, 10, 15 minutes, but um, I'm very interested in the data that Zillow has. Um, I know your website, you have zillow.com research slash data, um, and from there you can get down to the neighborhood level um, with the, uh, you know, the price, um, the, the square footage, my question is, though, would Zillow partner, I'm an academic, um, I'm at University of Albany, does Zillow have a way to partner um, with researchers uh, for grants um, to exploit the data that you have on, like, the characteristics of the housing unit? Um, like, I'm really interested in whether there's, like, an air conditioning unit, whether there is a generator, um, so I'm, I'm very interested in these issues because they really impact climate change. Um, and unfortunately, just the census data, does, they don't ask those questions in the American Community Survey. And 
the American Housing Survey um, is very limited um, in, in the scale at which you can get the data at that low level of geography. So that's my question. Yeah, uh, Trey, do you know about the data availability of that specifically? Um, we see these generators. Um, I would encourage you definitely reach, reach out to this, this contact email, press at Zillow.com. Um, we, we definitely okay. work with academics uh, very frequently, and we're always very happy to, to help in whatever we can. So we can, if, if, if we don't know right now to answer your question, um, definitely follow up, um, and we'll look into that for you. Okay. Yeah, Thank I you. I don't know whether that uh, particular data is in our set and how it's formatted, but the um, yeah, definitely uh, go through the channels to um, figure out if you can get access. It'll depend on how we source that data uh, properly. So, uh, but you know, our contact uh, if you reach out, we'll be able to let you know. Okay, so pressedzilla.com is where I should send an email. Yep. Yeah, and that will likely get redirected to our uh, our data side. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much. The next question comes from Guy. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for the presentation. I think this is a question for Alexandria. Up, up a couple, up until a couple of years ago, you had county level data on rental cost index and inventory, and now all I can find at the county level is home sales mm -hmm. prices. So do you know why or what changed on your site that you don't have that uh, level of geographic um, availability anymore for, like, the rental and inventory uh, yeah. stats and some of the others? Um, well, thanks for being such a long-time user of our data. Um, and, yeah, we have taken off county-level data um, just in terms of you know, time, resource constraints. That's not, um, unfortunately, a data series that we could regularly produce publicly. Um, that said, um, again, you can reach out to us to this email that's on the slide, press at zillow.com if there's a particular series that you need, um, and we could see if we could pull that ad hoc for you. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. And just another point that um, our Rent index series, Zori, Zillow Observed Rent Index, is a little bit different than uh, what has been our rent index in years past. Um, so now it's a repeat rent index instead of um, just an aggregation, like the median rental value across the entire housing stock. Um, so to do a better job at controlling for things like housing quality. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I am showing no other questions at this time. It is star one if you have a question from the phone. I actually have a, a couple questions that came through the chat. Um, so one of the questions was, will you eventually begin to analyze those areas that are semi-suburban and closer to rural areas known as the exurbs? Exurbs. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's not um, like a data series that we produce on hand, like on our data site, um, but certainly, you know, that's a, that's a whole, you know, um, area of urbanicity that, that we can and should look into. Um, so I think especially as, you know, remote trends play out, I think that would be uh, great for us to continue to look into. I do want to oh. take a second there to... Um... Uh, pr promote the data product that we're using to define uh, urban, suburban, and rural. Um, the same source does give a continuous measure of uh, urbanicity uh, in addition to the, uh, the, the classifications. And so uh, that's, a, that's a great resource to be able to uh, cut a little finer on, you know, what you want to consider uh, suburban, exurban, rural. And it's what we'll be using. Thanks, Trey. Um, here's another question. Do you think the quick rebound may have been due to the very low interest rates? 
Yeah, I mean, I think we definitely see that as a big reason. Um, I think our the three main drivers that that we believe this boils down to is again the the demographic shift, um, very low interest rates, and sort of the pandemic itself, right, shifting housing preferences. Um, so it's definitely low interest rates has been a huge driver. Um, does Zillow share their data on housing units? If so, where can researchers go to get access? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by housing units. Um, so we have data on, like, total inventory, um, just like what's on the market, um, different different cuts of that inventory data. Um, perhaps that's, that's what you mean. <laughs> Well, here's another question that might be um, relatable to it. Does Zillow have an API to allow the data to be used in a dashboard? Uh, we do. Um, so if you go to Zillow.com slash data, um, that'll take you to that page that you saw screenshots of. But there's also a link um, that, that will describe how to use our API to get to that same data. What do you make? of the trend for production builders, such as Dr. Horton, adding communities well outside the urban areas? Or is that just Dr. Horton? Um, you know, I don't want to, you know, shoot from the hip here on, on a topic that we haven't really done research on. Um, but, you know, we have seen strong suburban demand in a lot of areas, particularly if they're cheaper. Than, than urban, so I, you know, I, I would think that affordability and, and demand plays into that picture. Um, I'll do one more question and then we can just double check on the lines. How does ZHVI account for renovations and home improvements? My memory is that repeat sales in indices may only partially capture home improvements, so I'm curious if the presenters have any thoughts about whether differences in improvements might contribute to some of the urban-suburban differences found. Um, so, so VHVI is, is based on our estimates, so our profit into the aggregation. Um, our estimate is only as accurate as the amount of data we have on our home. So if we're not able to see that there have been renovations, um, perhaps the whole the home hasn't been sold prior uh, or after these renovations, that certainly wouldn't be as accurate. Um, that that I'm not sure that there have been a lot more, you know, renovations in urban versus suburban areas. Um, you know, but just generally, that's a great question. Um, I think the short answer is that there there will be some amount of error especially on, on things we can't observe uh, in our data. Great. Um, Jennifer, are there any more questions on the phone? We do have a question on the phone from Kaylee. Your line is open. Hi. Um, I was wondering, um, this might be slightly outside the scope of Zillow, but um, have you all been looking at potentially the relationship between housing prices, um, wages, and remote work? Um, my prior is that I'm thinking with more remote work, we might see a downward pressure on wages, and that might also show up in, in housing prices as well. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I don't. I think we're early on to to really see the effects of that. Um, Trey, do you want to jump in? Yeah, just to say. Um, that it's unclear right now, uh, you know, if and when we'll see that downward pressure. How uh, how companies that uh, that can uh, support remote employees will approach that. Um, so it's definitely too early for us um, studying housing to to quantify that specific trend. But we'd expect it to respond similarly uh, to any wage change, um, just with a, with a different geographical uh, geographical impact. Thank you. I'm showing no other questions from the phone at this time.
Okay, great. So um, we are at almost at the 245 point. Um, I know that there were a lot of questions on the chat, and what I will try to do is um, send them to the panelists, um, and then we could possibly um, have them answer the questions, and then we'll be posting that on our website at uh, census.gov slash academy under the webinars tab, and we'll just um, accompany all the questions that were not answered um, in a, um, a Word document, hopefully, and then uh, we'll be able to answer your questions. So I apologize that we couldn't get to everybody else's uh, questions, but I would like to take this time to just thank uh, Alexandra Lee and Nicole Bouchot and Trey Manhertz for such a wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation, and I, I can tell that it was very well received, so I really appreciate the time um, that you all did um, for this excellent presentation. The LED webinar series will continue again on April 21st, uh, 2021 at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time when Andy Haight presents Improving Access to Key Data, Key Census Data, What's New on COVID Data Hub and Census Business Builder. So with that, I hope everyone has a safe and happy St. Patrick's Day. That concludes today's call. Thank you for participating. Please disconnect at this time. Speak